This week, American Art Forum is going to look at lost arts. My first guest, Ben Crump of Meredith Long Gallery in Houston, Texas, and I will discuss forgotten American artists of the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. Then, after a break, I'll be joined by Andrew Hoyam of Aryan Press in San Francisco. We'll discuss the preparation and publication of limited edition fine art books. So stay tuned. The show will provide a lot of information. And if you get a pencil and paper ready for later in the show, then you'll be ready for my exhibition listings. Art has been a mystery and a joy for millions since the beginning of man. Is art meaningful to you, or is it a strange and distant part of our culture? Then let art historian Richard Love and his guests make art come alive by exploring every avenue of the American art community. Love focuses on its makers and shakers, its traditions and its innovations. You may not always agree, but you will like what you see on American Art Forum. Now here's Richard Love. Here in the United States, there are surprisingly few art galleries which concentrate their attention on American art. But Meredith Long and company in Houston has been specializing in the buying and selling of American art for over 20 years. One of Mr. Long's favorite projects is the rediscovery and promotion of once well-known artists, something like what I've done over the years. Anyway, this week, Ben Crump, the gallery's director, is here to share with us some of the gallery's favorites and, of course, the ideas by which all this happens. Ben, welcome to American Art Forum. Thank you, Richard. It's, it's nice sure, to be here. It's sure good to have you after I saw you over at the, over at the Expo uh, some time ago. Uh, and now here you are in Chicago enjoying uh, good weather. And uh, uh, I know that uh, between Chicago and Houston, there's not much. You stand pretty much as one of America's leading galleries. And in Houston, I don't think you've got a whole lot of competition, do you? No, not really. We have a lot of very good galleries, Richard, but we have no competition really when it comes to the expertise in doing the art that we represent from the 19th century masters from Luke's, Bellows, Shin, Cassatt, right on down through the 20s, 30s, and 40s to the American uh, Motherwells, uh, Olitsky's, Dan Christensen's, Hutos, right on down the line to the young Texas artists today. So Basically, we have quite a stable. Then you're talking about pretty much the cream of the crop from late 19th century, is it fair to say late 19th late century? Late 19th century, exactly. But when we think about the, the 19th century with your gallery, mm -hmm. we have to think of George Ennis, oh, who yes. is quintessential yes. uh, with 19th century painting and the sophisticated uh, movement from tonalism to impressionism and that. So is that pretty much the earliest part of your, the way your collection begins? Uh, I have some that goes a little bit earlier, uh, but uh, I really only about two or three I think we start with Ennis, and Mr. Long has been specializing in Ennis for a number of years, and we have quite a few beautiful Ennises in the gallery right now. In fact, because I bought two very nice Ennises down with me for this show, one of the Italian Ennises and one of Hastings, New York. Now, uh, Ben Crump, you are basically the director of sales Correct. at Meredith Long Galleries. Right. That you have, you've, uh, you didn't just start there. You've, you've been elsewhere prior to that, haven't you? Yeah, I worked with a very, very dear lady that I believe you're going to be interviewing later on, by the name of Betty Moody, and I got started with Betty, and then switched over when the opportunity came to Meredith because it was a good growth period for me, and it was a period that I wanted to get into and expand my expertise, and it was a marvelous opportunity, and I've been with Meredith going on eight years now and hope to continue it for a while. But your job is selling art, and I think it's interesting for many of our viewers. You know, if you're, if you, if you're selling art, so many people come to me and they say, how do I get into this thing? Mm -hmm. So now here's a man who can tell you all about it, but I, but I think that your, your expertise is double-fold, and it might do some of our viewers out there uh, some good to hear about how you've done it. And you have a background both in art history and in business or economy, isn't it? Well, it was in business administration. Mm -hmm. But I got into the art field, as I was telling you earlier, strictly because I became a collector. Mm -hmm. And I started collecting prints. And, you know, I, I couldn't afford what I wanted to buy, so the prints came along. I liked them. I bought the prints and went over to Betty Moody one day, and her, uh, the woman who worked with her was getting ready to go to Europe. And I said, Betty, you can't stay in this gallery by yourself. You've got to have somebody in here to help you. The rest is history. And bingo. Now you've been <laughs> bingo. with Meredith for all these yeah. years. Um, the the uh, prerequisites for selling art, naturally, you have mm -hmm. to love it, as you've just indicated. Mm -hmm. You started out as a collector. You have to know something about mm -hmm. it. Um, but the business admin degree must have been very, very helpful for you. 
I was in retail for a number of years before, so I did have a good sales background. And I, th I think it is very necessary that you have a sales background. You've got to be able to deal with the public. You've just like it's really no different than working Any anywhere else. Right. Anywhere you go, you've got to be able to handle the public. Let's uh, show our viewers some of the some of the slides that you right. we brought along, uh, and some of these works. Well, all of the works are very important. We're, the first one is by Morton Schomburg, and we oh, should yeah. look, take a look at that. Uh, then we've got another one later on we're going to show. Uh, but let's take a look at the Morton L. Schomburg uh, slide, if we, if we can. We're waiting for that to come up on our viewer while we are. Uh, would you not say that Schomburg is, um, is pretty much representative of these, uh, well, 30s, 40s, and 50s group yeah, that you specialize in? Yeah, he is. Schomburg is a bit more f the fluid and in, in, in not quite as hard edge or mecha uh, mechanical as some of them get to be. But he is, yeah, he's a good example of it. And this is an early one. Well, uh, unfortunately, we must be having some problem because it's not coming up. But let's well, also it, talk. We, we can trust us. It's beautiful. Uh, it, well, <laughs> it's we're going to see it. We'll, we'll okay. just wait for it. But we have another one we're going to show, Man Ray. Again, uh, works by masters from the 30s, 40s. And, oh, here we have the Schomburg There's the now. Schomburg. Okay. Right. Now, now, how big is this piece uh, that about? That piece was very small, Richard. It was about about a four by six inch, mm. not very large at all. And not, and let me take that back, Richard. That was about a six by twelve. Let's let's let me correct that. It's <laughs> got, you see so many. You Real. know, you, you you get. Wait a minute. Now, which one is this? Real here, but brilliant yeah. electric colors. Uh, going back this early, almost a. Uh, almost a, a geometric abstraction, although we're working with the representat it, representation. You know, it, it also gets, it's almost very industrial in feel. Oh, indeed. Richard, very much you so. You have to think of Sheeler and people like sure, that. Sure, sure. Yeah. The colors are marvelous on this. And this is also a pastel, Richard. And it's a very nice one. And I think, if I'm not incorrect, the date on this one is about 1923. Yeah, I think it's dated up there at the top, but mm -hmm. again, very early. I'm simply getting, a, trying to get the point across that what with this industrial look, these these man-made objects, mm -hmm. it comes off almost, you can't help but be reminded of some of the color field painters and the exactly. target pictures. Exactly. Very no, advanced sure. idea and so. composition. Let's, uh, let's quickly jump to another piece that you had uh, at the International Exposition, a work by Man Ray. Oh, yeah. uh, what a great painter. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you have many works by Man Ray? Here it is now. I oh, mean. that's this is from the Revolving Door series, and I, it was very interesting because we later found out that the true colors that come up in there through the years that this has faded, and where you see the oranges were once brilliant yellows, and some of the great they, they, oh the tones over there next to the grays were greens, and they were they were really quite brilliant. So in you colors. had to clean it. No, it has not been touched because this, these, this is a collage. I see. And it's faded through the years. I see. But they're really quite lovely. When you say collage, what are the uh, additive uh, uh, materials? Oh, is this one was just cut out paper? paper, just strictly like a cardboard paper. And how big is the piece? Is it, a, is that it the piece structure a, on canvas? That painting was about a 24, 24 18 by 24. Hmm. It was a larger one. Hmm. And it was very nice. And this was a series called the Revolving Door Series. Do you have others from the series at the gallery? I have a few of the Revolving Door Series. I have the Man Ray, the photography book, uh, what he, that he did with those wonderful puppets, the sort of naughty ones we say. <laughs> you know, when, you, when we think about that kind of work, it's so exciting to see that so much was being done. It's almost a period of total flux. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about after the Depression, up until, say, 1950. Mm -hmm. uh, people love to begin it post-World War II. Oh. Well, that's fine, but what a tremendous area of flux. I mean, it was just, it was just a state where it wasn't the pluralism that we see today, mm -hmm. but it was where the lingering aspects of Impressionism and all that sort of thing would, would just back up and against a fence. And, and uh, so, so many times the exhibitions would exclude those kind of mm -hmm. people. Other times it uh, works by people like Man Ray were the only things that were accepted. Do you see an opening up in appreciation of this period? Is that why you're special or is it Meredith's special idea? Well, Mr. Long has always had an extremely good eye for these things, Richard, and he's a very knowledgeable man. And I think he saw years ago the importance uh, that these paintings were going to be. And it's like, it's like so many things. Americans have always has sort of had a snob appeal. You know, and if, it, if there was this generalization that if it didn't come from Europe, then, you know, they didn't want to have it. How true. And, and it's a very sad thing. And now it's been brought to light that these paintings are as, as important, if not more if important, not more important 
than a lot of the European painters were at the time. Well, are you finding, you know, unfortunately, Houston has the reputation for being, uh, well, the, uh, it has an elitist group in the culture. Is that, is that true? Can you say that? I don't, I don't know that I see that so I've, much. I've, really? Yeah, I've, I've heard that there's a, a kind of a cliquish uh, group who fairly runs the, the cultural end of things. What I'm trying to get at, uh, in Chicago, in New York, you'll always find a certain group uh, who seems to be the friends of American art here, the friends of American art there. But we, generally speaking, it seems that there's a much greater acceptance overall now of art. Mm -hmm. And with these people of the post-war era, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, do you see, I mean, it's not necessary to go to Picasso anymore, is no, it? No, not at all. It's not necessary to, uh, when we're looking at Arthur Dove mm -hmm. or we're looking at Man Ray, we sure. can see them with the same dignity. Mm -hmm. uh, is that true in Houston? I think so because we've had people like Meredith Long and then there was uh, Ben DeBose who was there with, along with Meredith who opened. 25, 27 years ago. So the people in Houston have really had an opportunity to have a good education about these artists because we had these two men who were very interested. Ben is dead now, Meredith is still in business and will be in business for a number of years. And I think the really important thing is, Richard, is that Meredith took the time to educate the people. He just didn't take the art and put it out there and say, here it is. He gave you reasons why that art was there. He gave you the reasons, the importance of the artist. He brought in shows from New York. He's brought in shows from all over the country. We, we, he's always looking for shows to bring in. And it is to sell, but it is also for an education. People are not intimidated by galleries. And there's, we, in our gallery, my partner Jeanette Pliner and I have one rule between us. We do everything we can to make the client as comfortable and give them the opportunity to come in and see the kind of art they want to see. And if we don't have it out, we'll go to the vaults and bring it out for That's them. That's fantastic. Let's take a look at a work by Lee Krasner quickly. We don't That's have that much time, Krasner. but we do want to see this. What a powerful Isn't picture. Isn't that incredible? What's painting? the medium? This, it, th there's a slight impasto on this. It's an oil on canvas. How big is it about? This one is about 36 by 48. It's a good size canvas. It's a good size canvas. Mm -hmm. And I, th I like this very much. In the show that we just finished for Lee, there were two that were this, this charcoal coloring. And the colors just zapped out at you. And we had a, a lot of uh, drawings, black and whites, and also colored pencil drawings. And this was from an early period of hers. This was about 33, 34. And of course, I think Lee Krasner is one of probably the most overlooked oh, American the, artists we have today. Don't you think it's the eclipse with, uh, with Pollock? Don't you of think that's because of, of the problem? Of have you was. had Pollock as well? We've had Pollock, and you know I get myself in a great deal of trouble for my next comment, but I believe that there are a great many Krasners that I like better than I do the Pollocks. Well, I don't see anything wrong with liking them better. There might be some art historian or some curator who'd oh, say, well, they're not, as pieces for that. <laughs> they're not as important, perhaps. Well, or, I think that they will be as important, though, well, and I, I think, think we're seeing that now. Somebody needs to do a great, big, smashing retrospective. We did. Barbara Rose. Well, that did a marvelous retrospective and took it to New York. How long it in ago Houston. was that? It's about three years ago. Mm -hmm. And thanks to Barbara, we've got Lee Krasner back out there on the market again today. And I think we're going to continue to see her. And I think that she's going to be, her importance is now coming into focus and it will just continue to go. So everything's healthy in Houston. Everything is marvelous. I look forward Don't to Don't listen to what anybody tells you. We are healthy <laughs> and wealthy and wise. It sounds great. <laughs> I look forward to having you back. Unfortunately, Richard, we're out of time. Thank you very much. I enjoyed being asked. Great to have you, Ben Crump. Well, I'm sorry we're out of time, but uh, it's been great having uh, Ben here, and I want you to stick around. We're going to talk about fine art books with Andrew Hoyam after some brief messages. See you soon. Publishing fine art books in America had its heyday in the 1930s, primarily through works published by the Limited Editions Book Club. However, the Aryan Press in San Francisco is one of the finest companies maintaining this tradition of bringing great artists and great writers together. Quite a job, don't you imagine? Well, joining us is Andrew Hoyam to tell us something about the current and future project of the Aryan Press. Welcome to American Art Forum. Thank you, Richard. Great to have you. Glad to be here. Um, you know, I think that when you combine aesthetics, there's nothing more complicated than the director of that job. I mean, that's not a simple task. Uh, it's hard enough when you're working with the visual arts or the performing arts or literature or whatever it may be. Now, when you put them together, um, I don't know if I envy you in your position. What a, what a task. A book is a very complex object. Uh, we are not only trying to combine uh, handsomely the typographic aspects of a book, but 
the graphic aspects, the visual parts of it in illustration, and above all of that, to make a concept, a literary and artistic concept that transmits an idea. But it's not new, is it? It's an old, old, I mean, we go back into well, 18th century England, 19th century France, and we some of, see some great, great products. Yeah. Then in America, you continuing that now. Um, I, I was fascinated with, uh, uh, I mean, we, we, we're going to talk about the books, but, but really we should talk about this, the posters you have here, too. Why don't we take a quick look? Uh, what camera are we going to use for this? I think this one over here. Look at this. This is a. Could you tell us something about this, Andrew? Certainly. Uh, this will be the uh, portfolio of the first publication of the ornithological paintings of Andrew Jackson Grayson, who was known as the Audubon of the West. Yes. He w uh, died in 1869, and his 156 of his original paintings have languished. Uh, in the Bancroft Library at the University of California at Berkeley. Til, till when? Until now, they will be published for the first time. Is that uh, right? By our press, and uh, then there will be a traveling exhibition that will begin at the Oakland Museum and travel around the country, ending at the Smithsonian Institution. Is there, how many museums will it, will it show? Well, we're hoping for about four, four museums mm -hmm. along the way. The other dates are not yet set. Well, the piece that we looked at is King Vulture. Now, what is the, how is the original done? Is it egg tempera or just exactly what it's is a, it? It's medium? a pencil drawing with watercolor mm -hmm. uh, added over the uh, pencil drawing. Yeah. Um, Grayson followed on Audubon. He was uh, inspired by seeing Audubon's Birds of America in, in the mid-1850s in San Francisco and then devoted his life to drawing and uh, recording the, the birds of uh, of California and in Mexico. All right, that's the old <laughs> stuff. What about the new stuff? Michael Graves, Jasper Johns, Jim Dine, Eric Fischel, Francisco Clemente. My goodness, you, you've taken the whole nucleus of the m contemporary art group and, and, and taken on a project with them. We're trying to make an, Amer uh, an American branch of the great French tradition of the Livre d'Artiste. Really? The books uh, that so intimately involved the, the, the work of major artists. Um, I suppose the first artist that I really became involved with in this very uh, deeply collaborative way was Jim Dine, and he and I did uh, an illustrated edition of the Apocalypse, the Book of Revelation from the Bible with woodcuts that uh, Jim Dine uh, cut especially for the book, and they were not printed anywhere else except in our limited edition of 150 copies. So we actually are seeing a graphic production of 150, a limited edition of 150. Mm -hmm. Must have been some overruns in case of problems with the books, but generally 150. Now, was each one signed also in the book or...? Signed by Jim Dine, yes, and numbered. One through 150. With 150 books, they must have cost a billion dollars to get to you to be able to afford to do such a thing. What was the price on one of those books? It was uh, $1,500. Well, that's yeah. surprisingly inexpensive when you consider that they're getting the woodcuts, a marvelous book in, in and of itself. Um, you've also worked with Jasper John. Yes, and I can show you that book. I happen to have a copy along. It's a, This is an edition of the selected poems of... Wallace Stevens. Why don't we hold it up to this camera right here and, has, and then tip it up just a little bit. Wallace Stevens, what it a It has a marvel. beautiful uh, frontispiece by Jasper Johns, which he made especially for this book. It's an, it's an etching that was printed at uh, Universal uh, Limited Art Editions in, uh, in West Dyson. There's the Aryan Press, San Francisco, 1985. And as we continue, go ahead. The selection of poetry was made by Helen Vendler, who is one of the foremost we'll look critics at this camera in, this, this way. in this country and an authority on Wallace Stevens. Let's she wrote a... Slow down just a little bit. We'll show our viewers uh, some, some of the idea, such as that. All right. Marvelous. Deckle, edge, deckle edges on all the pages, it, it appears. I yes, guess it's, it's not deckle it's, edges. Yes, it is. It's an English mold-made paper. It's a marvelous. And, uh, the type is of, it has quite a lot of hand work. Some of it is hand set and it's printed by letterpress. All right, tell us, tell us something more. Uh, what you, well, you worked with Jasper Johns, for example. 
uh, the famous Johnsonian attitude, as they say, where he says very few words. Um, that's a big project. When you're working with someone as, shall I say, eccentric as Jasper Johns, uh, this, this is a long-term project, a lot of complicated procedures to go through. Uh, you frequently have to work with temperamental or eccentric people. Um, you are the liaison, in effect, are you not? You're the designer, you're the, you're the whole thing in a, in a, in a ball of wax. Mm. The, well, is it for, fortunately, the, the artists that I've been working with have been a joy to work with. Uh, Jim Dine and I have become quite good friends over the years. We've been working together, and now I'm starting to work with Eric Fischel, who is a very likable fellow, very and sensible, very and, popular and, and, right and, now. And, a, and a magnificent artist. We're working together on an edition of Lolita, and uh, Eric Fischel will make a suite of prints that will illustrate Nabokov's great novel. So is that in the works already? Uh, well, Eric Fischel at the moment is in France doing preliminary drawings for the prints, and I hope that we will be able to bring it out next year. Our current project, if you Sure, we'd to love shows, to see it. The, the uh, big sleep? The big sleep of Raymond Chandler. And now that's this year. Yes, that's it will be published in June. Let's hold it June. up straight for our viewers to see. All the right. binding is of plexiglass. Yes, it's a very that unusual is that binding. strange stuff. <laughs> it makes a it makes a, a funny a funny sound. It, it's it's almost uh, well, it's plastic. Yes. <laughs> what an unusual with, with binding. With a silk screen title, the the book has been let's, designed let's turn in a, it this way, in a rather modern way. way, as you could tell from the cover, and it's been illustrated let's with. Hold, let's hold with, it right uh, there. Okay. Go. It's been illustrated with photographs by Lou Stoneman. Uh, in the manner of motion picture stills, movie stills. Is that right? Well, well here we have a, one of those. Here we have a Raymond, uh, Raymond Chandler's private detective, Philip Marlowe. Yes, and it says, I was everything the well-dressed detective ought to be. I was calling on $4 million. Beautiful quality. I have to comment for our viewers, the marvelous quality. Um, now, this is, what kind of photographic process is this, Andrew? We've... Uh, We've printed the photographs with six runs. First of all, we laid down two opaque white uh, runs on each page mm -hmm. underneath the photographs, and then over that a blue-black duotone, and over that two runs of varnish, so that these photographs look as much like original photographs as I suppose you could mm -hmm. manage within a, a book that was printed on uncoated stock. Yes, indeed. Marvelous, marvelous. Um, when, you, when you take on a project like this, you have to worry about the copyright. Uh, you have, to, uh, as far as the liter literary end is concerned, you have to worry about the quality of the paper. You have to worry about the layout and design. Uh, is that completely and totally handled by you? I, I, I have a team of five people working with me, and, and we all contribute. Uh, and since we're doing three or four books a year, we must overlap in our responsibilities, but yes, we do coordinate all of the matters of obtaining the text and permissions and from the stand from the commercial standpoint. Um, are they usually sold out? Our, I can claim that all of our books sell out eventually. Some of them sell out very rapidly. Uh, the Wallace Stevens book published in December sold out in about two or three months. So the big job then is to make sure. Uh, that it is a commercial success, so you can continue with, your, with yes, the rest so of it. so we them. can go on with more books. Exactly. Um, why not larger editions? Uh, the books that we produce with original prints are sometimes limited to, let us say, 150 copies because of the methods of printing, so yes. that we can guarantee to our customers that the quality will remain high throughout the edition. We did an, uh, an edition call, uh, called The Temple of Flora with Jim Dine, with, for which he made uh, dry point engravings on copper plates. And by printing 150 copies, we were, I think, going toward the upper limit of what we could make for the fidelity. Strictly that we to could. maintain that old Ruskinian yeah. quality that we, <laughs> right. that we look for in, yeah. uh, in, in great works, sure. well, books, which include works of art, yeah. I should say. Yes. When, and when we produce a book like The Big Sleep, we'll go up as high as 400 copies. But that's my upper limit, because I feel that with 400 copies, the human attention span will be maintained, and that we and our group will be able to watch over each copy in the edition and so that it comes out as well as, as, is, as is humanly Indeed. possible. Can people find these on book stands? 
<laughs> there are rare book dealers. Very, so very, very special books. And some are dealers stands. who who carry them, but, but mostly they, they come to the press. And they can contact Darien Press in San Francisco yes, for yes. for uh, any information. Can they not? That's right. Maybe Andrew not. Hoyam, it's been great having you on American Art Forum. Hope you'll be back again Thank one you, day, Mr. Lovell. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but uh, uh, of course we'll return again next week. Hope to have you as our guest. I'm Richard Love, inviting you back. Till then, have a great week.